consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. On this episode of the What is Asia podcast, I interview Christopher Atwood, a professor of Mongolian and Chinese frontier and ethnic history at the University of Pennsylvania's East Asian Languages and Civilizations Department and the current chair of that department to talk about his new book, The Rise of the Mongols, Five Chinese Sources. Dr. Atwood, thanks for coming on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Great. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. So the book that you've written is called uh, The Rise of the Mongols, uh, Five Chinese Sources. Uh, can you just start by giving some historical and geographic context to who the Mongols were? And also, can you speak to some of the misconceptions that the general public tends to have about the Mongols, such as something you describe as the virgin birth of the Mongol Empire? Great. Yeah, so the Mongols, let me just first say, we can also talk about who the Mongols are. Uh, and very simply, if you look on a map today, Mongolia is a independent nation uh, that is north of China and south of Siberia. Um, so that's your basic geographical placement. It's uh, north of the Great Wall of China, um, and it extends into the forests of Siberia. Now, the Mongols when we talk about the Mongols, oftentimes, of course, we're meaning the Mongols of the Mongol Empire. So the Mongols of the Mongol Empire were the, the uh, ancestors linguistically, culturally, in many ways, of the uh, present-day Mongols. Of course, there's been a lot of change in Mongolian culture. Um, but And they came out of a famous environment called the steppe, the grasslands. Uh, when, we, when we have these grasslands in North America, we call them the prairie. When we have them in Eurasia, we call them the steppe. But that's the environment out of which the Mongols came. It's a very famous part. And of course, that meant that they were, they were nomads, um, which is something that is a very kind of uh, people tend to really – exoticize or sort of see it as some sort of very mysterious kind of thing. But what that simply meant was that they were following their livestock um, through pretty regular seasonal migrations. In other words, if it's winter, we must be in such and such a place. If it's summer, we we'll go to another place. Movements would happen um, you know, for uh, today. They happen around four times a year in um, in. Uh, in the past, it might have happened sometimes more, sometimes less. So a wide variety. Nomadism isn't something that's like one size fits all. There's lots of different types. So the Mongols came out of this very special environment. But one of the misconceptions that people tend to have with this very special environment is to think that they were completely isolated. And so that's really one of the, the big misconceptions. Uh, the Mongols were a representative of a kind of culture that existed across the central Eurasian steppes from in the east as far as Manchuria, in the west as far as Hungary. Uh, and in various centuries, these people had a kind of really very similar culture, many different language groups. So, for example, into the western part, many of the uh, these pastoral nomads of Central Eurasia were Turkic speaking. Uh, previously, some of them had been uh, speaking a Northeast Iranian language called Scythian or Sarmatian, Saka, and so on. So the languages changed over time, um, but the culture was based on this kind of nomadic pastoralism. But one of the things that made this very interesting was that the nomadic pastoralism gave them lots of uh, livestock, and lots of livestock means lots of ability to transport things. And so the people of the pastoral, uh, the, the pastoral peoples of Central Eurasia were some of the great sort of uh, transporters of things and ideas and people across uh, Eurasia from east to west, from west to east. So they were very much in contact with all these other kinds of uh, people. Now, the, oftentimes the the contact wasn't necessarily very positive. So during the time when the founder of the Mongol Empire, who was known in Mongolian as Chinggis Khan, uh, rather than uh, 
we use it, say, people say Genghis Khan. I don't know where that one comes from. Genghis Khan might be a little bit more of a, a closer to the uh, original pronunciation, but uh, Chinggis Khan is how he's usually said in, in Mongolian. So Chinggis Khan, um, in his childhood, he went through a number of experiences and his growing up uh, in which the then dynasty of North China, the Jin dynasty, was... Uh, doing the sort of so-called using barbarians to control barbarians policy. Now we think of that as a very, very nice, you know, peaceful policy. It doesn't involve conquest of war, but what it really means is basically paying cousins to kill other cousins um, and encouraging, telling, spreading rumors about some people to make them hate other people, and then and then giving them encouragement and weaponry when they want to attack their cousins and kill them. Um, so that's what using barbarians to control barbarians actually looks like on the ground. Um, and of course, that also meant we also have uh, Jin Dynasty accounts where they would, as part of this, strategically every once in a while, they would march in and say things. We found a camp of, you know, 5,000 people and we killed them all. Uh, and then we marched home and we had great, great celebration of our great victory of our Jin dynasty um, people over these threatening barbarians and so on. So the Mongols were very much, they came out of, of this context in which they were very much uh, being manipulated, controlled, things were happening from the outside. And so the Mongol Empire was in many ways a kind of a reaction to that and a, a way to once once they Chinggis Khan had unified Mongolia, it was really only a matter of time before somebody would be paid to rise up in rebellion against him, to cause some kind of hostility, to maybe assassinate him, something like that. It's guaranteed to happen. I mean, it, was, it was always happening before. So the Mongol Empire comes out of that movement. So I'd like to take note of the subtitle of your book, which notes that you use five Chinese sources to lay out the rise of the Mongols. So for a general audience looking at this, they might find it kind of striking and odd that you're using Chinese sources and not Mongolian sources. So what do we gain from using Chinese sources specifically over Mongolian sources? And uh, why do you use these five sources in particular? And how do they fit into this larger argument that you're trying to make in the book? Well, I wouldn't say I'm using Chinese sources over the Mongolian ones. The main reason these uh, sources, I translated them was because they're very important and they didn't exist in English. Um, a few of them hadn't existed in any, um, uh, in any um, European language. Some of them have been translated to German, for example, but none of them existed in English. So that's the basic reason why I translated them. I was using them in my classes and I wanted to have nice translations. And eventually some people started telling me, why don't you publish these things? So I went ahead and published them. But, you know, it's really interesting. When you look at any empire, um, there's a lot of different perspectives. And kind of by definition, I think it's really important when you look at an empire that you actually want both perspectives. You want the perspective of the conquerors. But you also want this perspective of the conquered. And in this particular case, the Chinese are being the conquered. Um, they are, we oftentimes think of the, you know, the, the China is the center and, and Mongols are this per barbarous periphery. But of course, in the Mongol Empire, it's quite the opposite way. The Mongols are the center and China is this periphery that is being um, uh, conquered and crushed. Now, there are uh, some very important Mongolian sources we can talk about later, but uh, so it's not like I want to say you should only read Chinese sources. You should definitely read the Mongolian sources as well, but you should also read the Chinese ones because, again, an empire also should be understood from below. So that's the first thing you get from, from looking at Chinese sources. You get a sense of what the empire looked like to those people who were being conquered. So that's one thing. We also get a sense of the importance of the North China in the Mongol Empire. Now, I talked a little bit before about how the Mongols had been uh, in this uh, situation of being used as tools, uh, different Mongol groups, different Mongol heady kingdoms and, 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 and warlord chieftains have been used as tools by the ruling Jin dynasty of North China. Now, um, 
In fact, Chinggis Khan himself, when he became, even after he became Khan, for five, four or five years after he became Khan, every year he would go and pay tribute to the Jin dynasty and bow down to the emperor, uh, Ch- the emperor, it's not ethnically Chinese, but an emperor of a Chinese style dynasty in what's now Beijing. Now, that little bit that he bowed down to the emperor that is nowhere in the mongolian sources nowhere uh that was something that was too embarrassing so what the uh so but that's in the chinese sources um and so that again it always depends on perspective if you just look at the chinese sources you're going to get some very distorted uh perspectives uh but if you just look at the mongolian sources also there's things that the mongolian sources don't want you to know about um and so it's best to use all of them the sources i used in particular i chose them because they they cover from some very early accounts of the mongols in fact the earliest accounts of chinggis khan written in any language are um two of the ones that i've translated in this count all the way up to kind of the beginning of when the the, the mongols start to have a really intensive interaction with Chinese culture. Uh, and we see the young Kublai Khan. He wasn't a Khan yet, but sort of uh, Kublai um, uh, trying to figure out this whole China culture thing and trying to figure out how he can be a Mongol, you know, with his Mongolian rituals and yet somehow make this work in terms of being a good ruler of China, kind of ruler that the Chinese uh, scholars would accept. So it covers the range of them. Some of the most interesting ones are um, um, ones written by people from the Song Dynasty. Now, if you know about Chinese history, at the time of the rise of the Mongols, uh, China had been at that time was divided into two um, uh, two different major dynasties. One, the Song Dynasty, which was a famous ethnically Chinese dynasty, which had a long history from 960 to ultimately the capital fell in 1276. So that was the Song Dynasty in the south. In the north was the Jurchen Jin Dynasty. Now, the Jurchens were a people, Manchu Tungusic peoples from the area of what's now Manchuria, and they ruled north China. So the interesting thing is the Mongols first conquered the, uh, the Jurchen Jin dynasty in North China. But a lot of people from the south of China, uh, Li Xinchuan and uh, Zhao Gong and Peng Daya and Xu Ting, these sources, they were looking at this conquest and they have a very interesting kind of, of perspective. Because from on the, on the one hand, yeah, the Mongols are conquering lots of things and sort of a lot of destruction and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, the Song Dynasty was always a rival of the Jin Dynasty. And so there's a lot of schadenfreude. There's a lot of like, yay, the Jin Dynasty finally getting crushed. Um, and of course, after a while, it gets a little bit like, hey, wait, these Mongols aren't any very friendly to our Song Dynasty either. Um, and so it gets a little bit more hostile over time. And finally, one other source, I just love it because it's a um, it, it's it's just a great story. Uh, we have the story of this guy, Ila Chutsai, who was um, uh, a interesting an ethnic Kitan, which is kind of a Mongol related people from Inner Mongolia. But he assimilated Chinese culture and was in many ways saw himself as exemplifying the tr- Chinese traditions of rule. He's got this task of of somehow. <laughs> explaining to Chinggis Khan and to Chinggis Khan's son, Okade, how we do things here. Uh, you can't just rule like you do in, 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 in the grasslands. And actually, interesting enough, then you can't just rule like they do often in, in, in Persia, like they do in Central Asia, because in fact, the Mongols also conquered a lot of Central Asia. So that was a real, um, uh, uh, his big rivals oftentimes were not sort of Mongols wanting to do old ways in the old Mongol way, but like people from Central Asia would say, oh, we, we tax people this way in our in our country. Why can't you just do that in China? But that's a great story. And uh, Ila Chutsai is a really interesting person. And um, it's just a great story of kind of success, kind of failure, kind of something uh, something in between. So jumping a little bit to Mongolian sources, you note something in your book called The Secret History of the Mongols. Uh, For people who don't know, can you just give a cursory overview of what is it and how does it illuminate our understanding of Mongols differently than other sources about Mongols? 
Right. So the secret race of the Mongols is the one big, the the one big history written in Mongolian that we have in the original language. Uh, it was written. There's a there's a, a, a big academic debate. It was written in some year of the mouse, in some mouse year. Exactly which one we don't know. I, I I'm I'm pretty confident it's 1252. Um, about 25 years after uh, Chinggis Khan died, others might disagree. Anyway, if that's a different question, uh, but it's a it's a it's a long, really vivid narrative history. Uh, maybe the most similar type of work that you might have read that someone might have read if you've ever read any Icelandic sagas. In some ways, it's it's very like that. The it, it, the people in it are historical. I mean, it's um, and the actions are. I think were intended to be historical, but the author really liked a good story, and 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 a lot of events are told in a way that is quite dramatic, with a lot of quotation and a lot of interaction. And you wonder how could the author have known that? Um, so, so it's a it's a kind of a saga of the rise of the Mongols. Uh, it was called secret because it had actually quite a few things about Chinggis Khan and the rise of the Mongols, struggles within the family that were kind of embarrassing um, or were somewhat secret. Um, and so uh, this, one of the ways in which this, um, uh, his, this history illuminates our understanding of the Mongols, it's very much about the picture inside the ruling family. And what you get from the, the Chinese sources, you get very little about this conflict within the ruling family. It's very hard to, it would be very hard to understand on the Chinese sources alone how that worked. But the secret history of the Mongols really brings that out. And of course, it also brings out the Mongol view in which, you know, the Chinese, they, they show up kind of, it's kind of there, but it's not super important. Um, and uh, in fact, it's much more about unifying all the Mongols and establishing a kind of Mongol empire than it is about what happened in these various places that they conquered. So that's another different perspective that you get. So uh, moving to sort of, I guess, broader, more philosophical topics that are sometimes discussed in history, I'd like to get a little bit of your take on Chinggis Khan as the person. How instrumental was he uh, as an individual in crafting this staggeringly large empire? He's often included in this aura of sort of great man history, similar to like that of Alexander the Great. Um, you know, great man history being, you know, you sort of have one single person taking the helm and being overwhelmingly responsible for some significant change in history. How appropriate is it to think of Chinggis Khan in that way? Uh, and I wonder, you know, we, we sort of tend to denigrate this way of looking at history now, but I wonder if you think there's maybe at least some legitimacy to uh, this way of thinking about Chinggis Khan. That's a great question. And let me just first say, though, um, if the Mongol Empire had stopped expanding when Chinggis Khan had died, it would not be such a great empire. In fact, uh, this is uh, something that's often forgotten. We talk about the Mongols conquering China and the Mongols conquering Russia. Well, neither of those things uh, were even anything close to completed when Genghis Khan died. So one of the things that's important to understand is that, um, and I'll talk a little bit about Genghis Khan's personality in a bit, but it was a family affair. Uh, the, the empire expansion continued, particularly under Genghis Khan's son and successor, Okade. And then after that, continued under uh, uh, Okade's nephew, Monke, and then continued further under Monka's brother, Kublai, who was the Chinggis Khan's uh, grandson. So these, um, the expansion, if, if, if like Alexander, Chinggis Khan had died without leaving his successor and the, his generals to divide up the empire, then it wouldn't have been uh, nearly such a big empire. So that's the first thing uh, to understand. Chinggis Khan, if he was a... If he was a great man, he was a great man, at least in part, because he established a kind of family system that enabled the empire to continue um, success. Now, another thing also uh, is uh, there's this interesting relationship between the 
the uh, the steppe background and the Mongol Empire. Now, militarily, steppe background is famous for, of course, cavalry and mounted archers. Um, you can see get a lot of there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, videos today you can find on YouTube about people doing practicing mounted archery. And mounted archery was absolutely crucial. And there's lots of interesting tactics that you hear that the Mongols used. For example, the fake retreat. Um, you know, a shower of arrows intended to distract and confuse um, the enemy and so on and so forth. But it's important to remember that all of the steppe nomads had these things. You can find the fake retreat a thousand years before Chinggis Khan. It's not like he invented that. Uh, you can find many of these tactical uh, things, these skills. There was some – there. Uh, before Chinggis Khan's time, there was certainly a certain amount of technical uh, innovation. The, for example, the stirrup. Um, there was also a fair number of, you know, of, of armored cavalry. The idea that again, the the, the century raisins were always light cavalry. That's not also correct. They oftentimes were armored. They had horse armor um, made of leather, with also with um, uh, leather, and in some cases, if you were wealthy enough, little bits of, of, of metal. Uh, sort of uh, um, uh, scales on the on the on the uh, leather. So, so you wonder then what made Chinggis Khan different? Militarily speaking, if you want to look at it, the really the thing that really made it different was the Mongols were successful at siege warfare. So they were without losing that ability to have sort of set field battles with mostly cavalry soldiers they were able to incorporate new types of battle and new types of new new whole new units of of subject peoples into their army so that was if you want to look at the one key thing that made them different from previous uh nomadic empires that was really it the ability to incorporate units of of engineers of people who would be uh, able to build and build very successfully and build sort of some of the world's best at the time, um, uh, catapults and ballistas that would fire rocks at, at cities and so on and so forth. And to do so in a, in a uh, way that uh, would continue over several generations. So in a sense, and this is really how the secret history of the Mongols also presents it. And I think we can also see from the, the, the five Chinese sources if there was something that was special about Chinggis Khan, there was something about the sort of the ability to bring together very diverse peoples and sort of make that work. So that's really where it comes from. Now, from a purely philosophical aspect, one of the problems with the uh, the great man theory is that the great manness can't be studied except in far of its success. So how do you know Chinggis Khan was a great man? Well, he he took a very divided, very fractious people and united them. <coughs> and he united them. <coughs> Excuse me. He took this very divided and fractious people and united them. And then you say, well, that's how we know he was a great man. And, and why was he able to unite them? these fractious people, divided people, because he was a great man. So it's a little bit circular. So, uh, but certainly the, the impression you get from the, uh, from the sources is that there was something fairly impressive about this person, even sources that are extremely hostile. Some of the uh, 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 Islamic writers, for example, or some of the uh, 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 Christian writers from the West, uh, they're very hostile to him, but they still say there was something you know, he had some sort of charisma. He also had an ability to predict uh, things. Some people said he, you know, he used shamanic spirits to predict the future. Well, whether or not he used shamanic spirits, anyway, he does seem to be able to have a pretty good sense of what would happen. Um, he was also quite loyal to the people who helped him. If you read about the courts of other contemporary dynasties, say in China or the Islamic world, um, you have a lot of people who wrote, rise to high fame and then get executed for being um, uh, for being threatening the power. Chinggis Khan appears to have had a pretty high ability to to use fairly powerful people without 
getting suspicious of them and and eventually executing them. And so I think in that way is maybe that's one of the one of the distinctive abilities that he had uh, and that uh, appears to have been pretty crucial in his success. Certainly, interesting enough, the, the member, older members of his own family, like his uncles and his, his elder brothers and such, um, uh, or his, his elder uncles, his, he was the oldest family, his uncles and uh, cousins had a kind of appalling mortality rate uh, by, during his rise. But with the people who were, how should we say, under him, that's to say people who came to serve him, his sons, younger brothers, he see, appears to have been a fairly loyal and um, unusually loyal and and sort of magnanimous person to those within his group. So j just before we wrap up, I just want to touch on sort of one more notable aspect of the Mongol Empire that kind of tends to make people interested in it. So uh, there seems to be a robust debate from what I can tell around for Mongol historians around explaining why the Mongols just kept expanding. They just kept going and going and going. You know, I've heard some people say, you know, the Mongols were, were better generals than they were government administrators. So that's all they knew. Uh, you know, explanations sort of like that. In your view, what was that end game? What what was the ultimate goal and what did that look like? That's a that's a real interesting question. You're right. There's a lot of debate about that. Uh, the first thing I'd want to emphasize, and there again, this is one of those things where I, I can hear the little voices of my colleagues uh, controverting everything I say as I say it. But I want to say, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, one of the big questions is, did the Mongols have an idea of world conquest? That is to say that they would just keep on going until they hit the great ocean around them. Uh, and and I would say, yes, they did, but not during the time of Chinggis Khan. Um, during the time of Chinggis Khan, they were what they were doing was primarily um, dealing with the people who had proven themselves hostile to the Mongols when they were in Mongolia or through subsequent actions. So in other words, Chinggis Khan always felt – I, I would I would estimate that he always felt that he had a a casus belli, a legitimate reason for war in all of the conquests he undertook. With the with the Jin dynasty, it was very clear. He says they had, you know, both the Chinese and the Mongolian sources are quite uh, unanimously agreed that the Jin dynasty had periodically undertaking campaigns to sort of, you know, what they would call mowing the grass, I guess, in, in, um, in, in a contemporary context, just campaigns to sort of um, uh, uh, destroy, de decimate any kind of uh, uh, people, nomads to the north who might be uh, threatening. So and from the Chinggis Khan's point of view, that was they were they killed our grandfathers and our fathers before us. So we, you know, um, he puts it in terms of vengeance, but it's also simply in terms of of and and we also have uh, people telling him, saying Chinese people or, or Kitan people, people within the Chinese cultural uh, sphere, people of the Jin Dynasty, who surrender to him and say, "You can't stop because if you just stop." conquering the borders of the Jin dynasty, eventually they will mobilize all their resources and there'll be so many troops, you won't know what to do with it. You've got to get in into the heartland where everybody is disarmed and then rip up the guts of the Jin dynasty empire. That's basically a paraphrase of the advice that a one um, a Kitan deserter gave to Chinggis Khan. So that's in Chinggis Khan's life. And then in Central Asia, that's the thinking. He was trying to establish peaceful relations with Central Asia. Uh, the famous massacre of the merchants that he sent to Otrar put the kibosh on that. In other places, he's conquering Mongol peoples like the Merkit and the Naiman. Then their fugitives run away and they run to, say, Kipchaks, Turkic nomads in what's now Kazakhstan. And those Kipchaks take, take them in and, and, and take in the refugees. Chinggis Khan sends a message to them he says send back the moose with my arrow in it uh and and they say uh no 
the little bush protects the bush protects the little bird from the falcon. Interesting. They exchange these interesting metaphors. Um, so Chinggis Khan says, "Now you're my enemy. You, you hold my um, uh, refugees from my conquest. That means you're my enemy." So then he conquers the Kipchaks. Then the Kipchaks they run to the Russians and the Ukrainians, uh, called the East Slavs in general, and the Ruthenians, and they harbor Kipchak. Um, they harbor Kipchak refugees. So Chinggis Khan sends a message to them. Uh, well, you know, you're harboring my enemies, turn them over, or you my enemies. So then they ha they don't turn them over, and then Chinggis Khan conquers them. So they flee to the Hungarian to the Hungarians and the Poles. And he sends a message to the Hungarians and the Poles. I think you can see how where this is going. Uh, and he, you know, and, and this keeps on going. Um, and so so in a sense, under Chinggis Khan's time, there does seem there's there's a kind of you know a a, a snowballing logic. Um, again, it's the logic of of many conquerors, which eventually, if you become a big enough conqueror, uh, everybody looks at you as you're kind of dangerous, and so everybody's trying to themselves try to find ways to stop you. And those actions in which they try to stop you tend to look pretty hostile. And so under Chinggis Khan. Um, that seems to have been a kind of a reactive um, thing, a searching for a security in a world that looks like really, really hostile. Under Ogade, his son, it really does seem to turn into something that's like uh, world conquest. And even in cases where the dynasties or the empires had not been very hostile, like, say, the Song Dynasty, um, and they they kind of had some some unwise things vis a vis the Mongols, but uh, basically, so eventually, Ogade is basically saying we should conquer these people just because they exist. Same thing with the Caliphate and much of Europe and so on and so forth. And so this becomes a big um, an aim, and we see that in diplomatic letters which the Mongols sent, uh, basically saying. Um, Heaven, eternal heaven, Mokatinger, gave us this rule of the world. And so you should recognize that and, and come and pay tribute. And if you do, we will protect your, you know, you will protect your, uh, allow you to rule under us and protect your kingdom and so on from, um, from uh, destruction. If not, then heaven knows. Who knows? Heaven knows. That's how the letters always end. So it, it does seem to have then eventually morphed into something that was really a kind of a, a program of world conquest. And that lasted uh, really until the late 13th century, at which point, um, depending around the time, certainly when Kublai Khan died in 1294, he was still trying to conquer Japan. He was still trying to conquer various other countries in Southeast Asia. But eventually when he died, his grandson, Temur, uh, who succeeded him and was the known as the um, Chengzong Emperor of the Yuan Dynasty, basically canceled all those expeditions and was basically willing to sort of um, accept that the boundaries that we have are the boundaries that we're going to have. The same sort of thing eventually happened in the uh, in the Near East with um, the Ilkhanids, which was a sort of splinter group of the of the Mongol Empire in the, in the in the Middle East, and they eventually came to an agreement with Egypt, which had been remained unconquered around 1323. So there was initially it was this kind of got to follow through on the conquests and the, the hostile hostile. We have to eliminate all the potentially hostile peoples around us. That was under Chinggis Khan. Then it turned into this ideology of world conquest, and eventually that kind of failed. And so eventually the Mongols uh, were able, had to, uh, able to establish a kind of a, 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 a fixed territory and rule within that fixed territory. Dr. Wrightwood, once again, your book is The Rise of the Mongols, Five Chinese Sources. Thanks again for coming on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Nakoda. And for those who want to see more content, you can go to the What is Asia podcast YouTube channel or nakodadefonso.com. We'll see you in the next episode.